Uh, hello everybody, uh, this is a continuation of our lecture on uh, generative Bayesian models for discrete uh, data. Uh, so in uh, the uh, lecture um, about a few days ago, we introduced this uh, uh, Bayesian concept learning, uh, sort of a classification problems for uh, discrete futures. And then we uh, saw other simpler models, such as the beta binomial model or the Dirichlet uh, multinomial model. And uh, we discussed about the calculation of the likelihood, the prior, the posterior. Uh, we talked about the computation that is involved for computing uh, the posterior predictive distribution. And um, at the end of the day, we concluded that um, uh, often we use point estimates to summarize the posterior distribution, such as uh, the map estimate. You know, a few lectures ago we had discussed, we spent a lot of time talking about the maximum likelihood estimate. And um, in this lecture, we also saw the posterior mean estimate, uh, which is very much different from the map estimate. And then somehow, for these simple models like the beta binomial model and the Dirichlet multinomial model, we noticed that the predictive distribution can actually be summarized with a plug-in approximation where the parameter that I'm plugging is uh, the posterior mean and not the, the map estimate. So somehow we were able to get the exact answers by utilizing the posterior mean as a plug-in approximation. And we will see a little bit uh, more of that uh, today. And um, this posterior mean as a plug-in approximation was extremely uh, uh, important um, uh, element of uh, Bayesian analysis because even when our priors are pushed to the uninformed limit, we notice that uh, using the posterior mean, it actually uh, stabilizes uh, the calculation and avoids uh, overfitting. And this is what um, uh, we refer to uh, as uh, ed one smoothing or ed one uh, stabilization. All right, so today we will uh, actually uh, do some examples of these discrete um, generative Bayesian models, and we're going to discuss uh, in particular about uh, uh, naive Bayes uh, classifiers as a specific example. Okay, so um, let's start uh, trying to introduce what a naive Bayes classifier is. So we're going to consider that we have this vector data that have uh, d number of futures. Okay, now. Uh, we will see shortly that each of these futures can be of different uh, origin, can be uh, scalar uh, quantities, can be, um, you know, binary futures. Uh, also, you know, uh, we will uh, also see the case where maybe each of these um, uh, vectors can take capital K values, all right? And uh, we will uh, revisit this type of calculation uh, in a few slides from now by uh, using uh, categorical futures. Okay, uh, but for now we're assuming that uh, we have um, vectors that have uh, a D number of uh, futures, okay? So we're going to try to classify this uh, data point. So we are solving a classification problem and we're gonna make a very strong assumption. And the assumption is uh, built in the equation that you see here. So let's try to uh, figure out what this equation says. So it says, given the class labels, all right, so if we knew to what class the point X belongs, then this conditional distribution factorizes over futures. This is exactly what we call a naive uh, Bayes uh, classifier, okay? So if we knew the class, we can factorize the conditional distribution of X given Y, uh, as the product of these conditional distributions of p of x, j given y, uh, from j1 uh, to uh, capital D. So this is what we call the naive Bayes classifier. Uh, obviously, uh, the name uh, naive uh, here uh, comes from the fact that uh, in reality, these futures uh, x, j are not independent. So this uh, is... Uh, may not be a reasonable assumption, but as we will see in many examples, uh, in many practical problems, this thing works 
quite well because in essence by uh, taking this independence relation uh, you know over futures uh, it requires less amount of parameters to be estimated and I call these parameters here as theta j uh, c um, for each class c so uh, it requires less number of parameters and if it requires uh, less number of parameters means uh, with uh, naive Vegas models, we can avoid uh, uh, overfitting. Okay, and we will see this uh, in uh, specific uh, examples uh, in a few minutes. Okay, um, so let's uh, continue. That's the definition of the uh, naive Vegas uh, assumption. And um, the, uh, as you can see from the factorization here, the number of parameters we will need uh, this theta jc will be equal to the product of how many classes I have. Let's say I have c classes times uh, the, uh, the, the number of futures. So the total number of parameters will be of the order of c uh, times, uh, uh, times d. Okay? And as I mentioned, because uh, of uh, this uh, naive assumption, we somehow have less parameters and uh, effectively we can um, uh, avoid uh, overfitting in many practical applications. So let's see what type of uh, problems uh, someone can uh, consider. So for example, let's take a very simple case where these conditional distributions um, uh, are, you know, so the, uh, these um, uh, futures that we're looking at are real valued. So uh, the decomposition of X given uh, the label Y uh, is now written down as the product over the futures of these Gaussians that they are parametrized with uh, some mean mu jc and some variance sigma jc square. Okay, so if you are going to have to fit um, for real valued uh, futures um, uh, this naive Vegas model, effectively what you would need to compute is for each class and for each uh, future, you're going to have to actually compute the mean and the variance uh, to represent these Gaussians. Okay, so uh, that's one case. So let's take another case uh, where uh, the futures are binary. So let's say that each of these xj's can take the value 0 or, or 1. So in this case, the uh, conditional distribution of x given y, it's actually this product uh, over the futures of these Bernoulli distributions, and you notice I only need the parameter mu jc that tells me that uh, for the class uh, c, what is the probability that the j future is on. Okay, uh, so this is enough because uh, I only consider binary cases, so the probability of the future being off uh, will be 1 minus uh, mu jc. Okay, so. Um, of course, you know, uh, for this discrete case, uh, the other possibility would be to use uh, futures that can take capital K values. That's the example that I started in the presentation today. So I am going to need to actually represent uh, these conditional distributions here on my factorization with categorical uh, uh, distributions. And uh, so now I don't have a single value uh, mu jc, but I have a whole vector of mu uh, JC and uh, this vector defines basically the probabilities that uh, when I'm in class J, I'm sorry, when I'm in class um, C and I look at the future uh, J, the probability of taking uh, any of those values 1, 2 to capital K is represented by the components of this vector uh, uh, bold mu. Okay, uh, so what we will try today. Uh, is to train this type of models and we will do mostly discrete cases but you know the case of uh, real value uh, uh, futures it will be as simple as the discrete case and uh, so for this uh, discrete futures we will train and training usually means to compute the MLE estimate for the uh, parameters that are needed to define my this conditional uh, distributions but also we will do the Bayesian case uh, and the task there would be to compute uh, the map estimate. And of course, in the process, because we're talking about this uh, add one smoothing that we have seen in earlier in the earlier lecture, we will need to discuss about uh, uh, some posterior mean uh, estimates 
and how uh, if we're going to use plug-in approximations, we can uh, uh, write down the predictive distribution for these uh, naive Bayes uh, classifiers. Okay, so um, so let's uh, proceed and see how we can compute the MLE and MAP estimates for this type of uh, models. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take only one point xi, right? So i here denotes one uh, point. And y i is the label for that point, All right? So this is part of my training uh, data set. So I am looking at point i, uh, that's x i, and the label for that point is y i. Okay. So remember, uh, the way we're going to write this now is, and you will see shortly how these parameters are coming in the picture. We're going to write this using the product rule of probability, f s p of x i given yi, all right, times the probability of yi. Now, um, this probability of yi, uh, you know, if we knew uh, the probability uh, for uh, uh, each class label, we can write it very easily as this product that you see in here. So let's try to understand uh, that p of y given pi is equal to this, right? So let's say that uh, my label, um, uh, so I'm looking at point i, right? And let's say that uh, uh, point i is, belongs to class 1. So you can see from all the terms in this product, the only thing that is going to be left will be pi 1. And all the other terms will give me actually 1 because the exponent here uh, it will be uh, 0, so I'm going to have pi 2 to a power 0, pi 3 to a power 0, which is 1. So uh, I am able to express this um, probability here of p of y given pi, all right, with this product uh, nicely, where pi 1, pi 2, pi 3 are the probabilities of uh, for this point xi being in class 1, in class 2, etc. All right, so here now what are we going to have? We're going to have the conditional probability of xi given yi. And if you remember, I can write this because I'm using the naive Bayes assumption. I can write this uh, by a, a product uh, of conditional probabilities over futures. So I'm going to have a product over j. This is my futures. All right. And now I am going to have the conditional probability uh, of uh, the uh, xij, all right, uh, conditional on these labels yi, and I'm going to do exactly the same simplification that I use for this product term. So I'm going to write this as the product over classes, um, uh, this probability to the indicator function of yi equal to c. And again, uh, if you think about it, if the point i uh, belongs to class 1, all right, then immediately what I get here from all of this product over the class C, I'm actually going to get uh, P of uh, xij given the parameters of uh, j1, uh, all right? So I'm going to get the parameters for the first future for class, uh, for class 1. So effectively, I can compactly write all of this in terms of the probabilities of its uh, class, right? And also in terms uh, of um, uh, these parameters theta jc that uh, define the parameters necessary to compute these conditional distributions for each future j uh, for each class c, okay? So again, the expression that you see on this uh, slide um, is for one data point, and if I move to uh, a whole collection of data points x1 to uh, x capital N, uh, effectively what I'm going to have to do is multiply this over uh, the, the same type of distributions for different i's. So you can see because I have products here, so when I multiply this with uh, different data points, I'm going to get the summation of all the indicator functions that belong to class C, and I'm going to call this NC. So NC is the number of data points that belong to class C, okay? 
And what I have done is, uh, you know, if you multiply all of these uh, terms using the first equation, you will get the likelihood. And what you see here is the log likelihood, right? So NC again uh, will be all the points that belong to class C. And I can do the same thing with this exponents, and this will lead to a summation. Um, so remember, I have a summation over futures, a summation over class, and now I'm going to get a summation uh, which will put together all my data points that belong to its class C. Okay, so I'm going to be summing these log probabilities of P of X I J given theta J C for all the data points I that belong to the class C. Okay, um, so a standard maximum likelihood estimator will be to uh, go and uh, optimize this log likelihood with respect to the parameters. And I remind you again, the parameters are uh, pi 1 to pi capital C. These are the probabilities of being in each of the classes. And then uh, the other parameters are theta jc. Uh, and remember, I have uh, as many of those as I have uh, futures uh, times classes. Okay. Now, I am not going to do all the derivations because actually we have done similar derivations uh, earlier in the course. Uh, so, for example, to uh, optimize with respect to pi c, you notice uh, this comes only on this first term. But remember, the sum of uh, all the pi c's is equal to 1. And that implies to do the optimization with respect to pi c, you're going to have to uh, also introduce a Lagrange multiplier times 1 minus the summation of these pi c's over all classes. But you know what the answer is going to be, right? So the answer is going to be that the MLE estimate for pi c is nc over n. Uh, so effectively, uh, pi c uh, MLE is the number of uh, the data points uh, that belongs to class C divided uh, by uh, the total number of my uh, training data points uh, N. Okay, um, you know, we can um, do the same optimization for the, uh, for the second term to compute the parameters theta JC, but obviously we're going to have to say something about what these conditional distributions for these XIJs uh, given the class label are all about. So if we take that the futures are binary, all right, uh, so if these conditional distributions are Bernoulli distributions defined with parameters theta jc, so again, what could be the theta jc is, theta jc is the probability um, uh, in class C that the future j is on. Okay, so again, theta jc is the probability that in class C, the future j uh, is on. Okay, so if you uh, do the calculation for the uh, MLE estimate for this parameter theta, theta jc for this uh, binary uh, Bernoulli case, the answer comes to be the obvious one again. Uh, we get that the MLE estimate for the parameters theta jc is nothing else but the number of times that I am in class C and the uh, future J is on divided, divided by the total number of times that I'm in class C. Okay, and I'm defining this clearly here uh, using indicator functions. So you can see NC is the times from uh, over my training data set that I'm in class C and NJC is the um, uh, times that I am in class C, but the future J uh, is on. Okay, and again, these uh, ideas uh, for these discrete distributions um, are very common, and uh, all these type of uh, MLE estimates lead to these empirical, uh, um, uh, you know, estimates that you see here and in the previous slide uh, as well. Okay, um, so. Uh, let's uh, continue. So that's the MLE estimate. And uh, I mentioned before that unfortunately this MLE estimate uh, overfits. Uh, so uh, what does uh, overfit uh, means? Uh, if we take here uh, two uh, Word documents, and these are, uh, think of them as computer manuals, one corresponding to 
um, um, uh, a manual for uh, X Windows and the other one a manual for MS Windows. Uh, each of these um, uh, documents has 600 features, so you can think that there are 600 words on my, my vocabulary. And what is plotted here is for each, um, uh, you know, uh, I have two classes, all right? Uh, one class is basically uh, this uh, Windows class and the other one is the MS Windows, uh, okay? And um, so when um, uh, you look, uh, these uh, uh, spikes here are nothing else but the parameters uh, theta jc that I uh, produce in the earlier uh, two slides. So each of these values gives me the probability that uh, I am in class C and that the future J or the word J is, is on. And if you can see carefully here for both um, classes, corresponding to X Windows and MS Windows, you notice there is a spike all the way nearly up to the value one, and that corresponds uh, to the word uh, subject that somehow is common uh, to both documents. So effectively, you can see that uh, in this uh, particular case, the naive Bayes classifier uh, using maximum likelihood estimation uh, overfits. Okay, and we have already said this is uh, not a good thing and we need to do something about it by uh, moving to a Bayesian setting uh, and if not doing the complete uh, posterior uh, and posterior predictive distribution, we at least need to do the right plugin estimate so we can improve the MLE estimates that you see uh, in uh, this particular picture. All right. Um, so, uh, the naive Bayes classifier um, uh, for this binary case is summarized with uh, uh, this uh, simple uh, uh, algorithm that you see here extracted from uh, Kevin Murphy's uh, uh, textbook. And again, there is absolutely nothing else but saying that uh, the probability of being in class C is the number of times um, you know, you are in class C out of the end. Uh, training data sets that you have and training data points. And theta JC is the time, the number of times that the future J is in uh, out of the number of times you are in class uh, C. Okay, so a very simple algorithm that allows you to uh, do maximum likelihood estimation for uh, this naive Bayes uh, classifier problem. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's do the Bayesian analysis, right? To do the Bayesian analysis, obviously, we're going to have to introduce some prior models. And uh, the only thing we actually know up to now, and, and we like it very much, is to work with uh, conjugate uh, prior models. And uh, before I remind you, we had the parameters pi for the probabilities of being in each class. And then we had the parameters theta for the probability given that I am in a given class for the future J, let's say, to be on or off, okay, for at least the binary case. So what we need to do, uh, we're going to need to introduce some conjugate uh, 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 prior uh, uh, models, and here they are, all right? So the uh, if I call theta all the parameters, including this theta JCs and, and the pi's, I am going to use a conjugate prior uh, for this, uh, you know, uh, you know, you have to remember the form, the likelihood was looking the way it was looking before. And I remind you, uh, the likelihood basically, you will see it in a, in a little uh, while again, it was basically this product, but on the exponent, I had the number of times uh, my, in my training data set that I was in class uh, K. So obviously a natural uh, conjugate prior is the Dirichlet distribution that you see here. And similarly, for the theta JC parameters, a natural conjugate prior for each class and for each future is this beta distribution that you see here defined in terms of the parameters uh, beta 0 and beta 1. So if you put this together with um, your um, um, you know, your likelihood model that you see on the bottom, you effectively not surprised that you compute that the posterior uh, is uh, in the same um, uh, 
uh, family of distribution. So the posterior for pi, it comes to be a Dirichlet uh, distribution with parameters uh, n1 plus uh, alpha 1. You can see this when you multiply this by that, right? The number of uh, empirical counts n1 will add with a1 and similarly for the remaining of the classes. And the posterior for the parameters uh, will also be a beta uh, distribution, but instead of beta 0, beta 1, now I'm going to add the number of times that I was in class C and the future J was on. And similarly here will be the number of times that I was in class C and uh, the future J uh, was off. All right. Uh, so this uh, conjugate distributions that you see on the bottom, uh, we have uh, visited them uh, before and we discussed in the uh, previous lecture uh, about the predictive distribution using this type of uh, Dirichlet and, and uh, beta distributions and we talked about the uh, limit of these distributions uh, when we want to make them completely uninformed and I remind you uninformed uh, means effectively that these parameters alpha will be equal to 1, all of them. Uh, so effectively this will become uh, the uniform distribution and similarly these parameters uh, beta 0 and beta 1, all of them will become 1. So that's the case of this, uh, the uninformed limits of, um, um, you know, uh, of uh, in our prior model and of course we need now to discuss how this will affect uh, our predictive distribution and of course we anticipate that the posterior mean to come uh, will come to the rescue and uh, will give us a direct answer for these predictive uh, distributions and we will see this uh, in, uh, in, in one or two slides from now. All right, actually not even one or two slides, it's uh, here, all right. So here is uh, let's say we have trained the model, we computed the posteriors of uh, the parameters pi, we computed the posteriors of these parameters theta jc, and now we need to do predictions. So this is my training data, right? And uh, already I have produced this posterior distribution of the parameters, and now you are throwing at me a new point x, and you're asking me what's the probability that this will be in class C. So what I have done here is I wrote this using the Bayes rule basically. I wrote this as the probability of y being in class C times this condition distribution of the vector x given the class C and you remember because we use the naive Bayes assumption that distribution of p of x given the labels uh, factorizes over the futures and this is what I have here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to need to compute the predictive distribution for each of these probabilities that you see here and I can actually do this in a very straightforward manner. Remember the predictive distribution is nothing else but an integral of the likelihood uh, times the, um, uh, the posterior. So this is what I have here. I have the probability of y uh, being in class C given my training data d and I write this as the, the likelihood. So if I knew pi is, I knew what this will be. It's a categorical distribution times the posterior, which we just computed and we computed to be uh, a Dirichlet distribution. And similarly this, right? It's a factorization over the futures. The likelihood is a Bernoulli distribution given the class labels. And then for the parameters theta jc, I have a posterior which we just computed and that posterior turns out uh, to be um, uh, uh, a beta distribution. All right. Uh, so you know now what the answer is because each of these integrals, I can actually go and uh, approximate it uh, with, uh, actually I can go and compute it uh, exactly uh, using the posterior mean uh, plug-in approximation. And it comes out that in this case, this is the final answer. So the, post the probability of uh, y being, uh, the label y being class C for my point x uh, after I have seen training data d is uh, this uh, plug-in estimate pi bar of C, which you notice here is the posterior mean of my Dirichlet distribution, right? So this is the posterior mean, um, right? So we remember we produce a posterior distribution for 
the pies that is a Dirichlet distribution. So if you look at your tables, this is your posterior mean for that Dirichlet distribution. Okay. And similarly for the beta distributions, we also have the posterior mean for the beta distributions. And if you look on the tables, this is the answer and we're done. All right. So we have the predictive distribution now uh, written uh, down in terms of these plug-in estimates. And as we already have seen, um, the, uh, we know that uh, these plug-in estimates uh, will avoid uh, the overfitting that I saw you before for the uh, two document problems. Okay. Now, yes, you can use other uh, plug-in approximations. You know, instead uh, of the uh, posterior mean, you can go and put, let's say, uh, the MLE estimate, or you can put the MAP uh, estimate. However, uh, uh, as we emphasized in the earlier lecture, uh, the posterior mean is the only one that results in uh, less overfitting, and uh, it is the only uh, plug-in estimate that works in the properly in this uninformed uh, limit um, uh, using that uh, what we call this uh, add one smoothing okay so even if you count um, let's say that the future j in class c is uh, um, uh, is on let's say you have zero counts for that this model will not predict um, uh, a zero uh, probability uh, for theta jc because of that add one smoothing that we have seen in uh, the earlier lecture. Okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, a practical implementation uh, issue that is very common to this type of uh, generative models. And you will see this uh, also uh, use, being a useful trick to many, many areas of machine learning uh, in classification mainly problems, so you will see it also in uh, deep learning. Um, how do you numerically um, uh, apply this Vegas rule the way that you see in this equation? And the problem here is that uh, these probabilities that you see here, these conditional probabilities of x given y, are very small numbers, in particular when the vector x is uh, very high dimensional, uh, and the idea here is if a vector is very high dimensional, the probability of observing any given vector x in high dimensions becomes very small because remember that uh, when you sum all of this, uh, the probabilities for all values of x, this comes equal to 1, but each of them in high dimensions, this p of x given y, it's a very small number. So, um, what we need to do is we need to compute this carefully and the, of course the anticipation is here um, and uh, the obvious answer will be well yes we're going to use logs to do this uh, type of calculation and of course this is what we will do we will take logs of this expression and we will approximate the Vegas rule um, we will compute it in the form that you see on the bottom uh, so notice here if I take logs I have defined BC to be the log of the numerator and, uh, and then I'm going to have minus the log of this summation of these terms which are my e to the power BC prime terms where BC prime is similar to this form here but instead of C I have a C prime. Okay, so again I am going to uh, define the logs of the numerator to be BC all right, and so in the denominator, I'm going to have the log of the summation of the e to the bc primes, because somehow I cannot take this log and put it inside, right? So I'm going to have the log of sum uh, of exponentials, and this is where now the trick comes uh, on how do you compute this log of the sum of exponentials and that's where this particular trick that's called the log sum x trick comes. Um, the good news by the way what I will describe today is uh, it's standard in uh, most machine learning uh, implementations like for example in PyTorch or TensorFlow this is an, a standard implementation so you don't really have to, uh, to do it. Uh, of course if you write your own program uh, be sure you implement uh, what I'm going to describe next uh, carefully. So what is this trick? Well, the trick is uh, very simple. Uh, let's say, you know, you remember here we have the log of the sum of exponentials. 
which are very, uh, uh, you know, this uh, e to the BC primes, they correspond to probabilities, so they're very small uh, numbers. So let's take an example of two numbers that are e to the minus 120 and e to the minus 121. So what you do is uh, you take the largest of these small numbers, you move it outside, so you're going to have log of e to the minus 120, and then inside parentheses you're going to have uh, e to the power 0 plus e to the uh, minus 1. And uh, if you write the log as the sum of two terms, you're going to have minus 120 plus uh, this log of two uh, more reasonable uh, numbers, way more reasonable numbers than having to calculate uh, log of e to the minus 120 and e to the minus uh, 121, okay? So this trick, of course, generalizes to our original problem. So if you move out, let's say, the largest of these BC uh, terms, um, so uh, uh, what uh, eventually you get is you get the log of this summation plus uh, capital B, all right? And this is what is called uh, the log sum uh, exp uh, trick, okay? Uh, here is a little algorithm from, um, uh, again, Kevin Murphy's um, uh, textbook. Uh, if you want to calculate this for uh, binary futures, so uh, this uh, calculates, um, you know, um, uh, the log sum exp through uh, a, a function that has been implemented in the uh, MATLAB uh, toolbox, okay? And at the end of this algorithm, for every point i, it actually gives you the class that this, you know, it gives you the, mark, the class that has the maximum probability, all right? So imagine that for each point you calculate all these probabilities that tells you the probability of being in each class. So this yi hat, it basically assigns you um, to the class that maximizes uh, uh, PIC, okay? So that's the, um, it solves the complete classification problem uh, for this naive Vegas classifier problem uh, for the case of uh, binary futures. Okay, um, now, um, so we, you know, we talk about this uh, uh, log sum uh, exp trick, right? But now I, I want to introduce um, something else that you may need to do in this type of uh, uh, problems. So imagine that you have a problem that you have uh, thousands or uh, millions of futures. Right, so obviously the uh, cost will be uh, uh, of the order of the number of futures. So if you have too many of those, uh, the number of parameters will be uh, very high. Um, you have a high probability for actually overfitting. So what you need to do is um, you actually need to figure out uh, if you actually need all of these futures. So you have to ask yourself, if I have a million futures, do I actually need them? And so what you can do is you can figure out what are the most uh, important futures and only keep those. And let's call the number of uh, the, um, important futures to be capital K. So we're only going to keep this capital K futures and we are going to get rid of everything else. And then we're going to build our classifier using this capital K most important uh, futures. Uh, so this is uh, sort of... Um, uh, a future selection, right? We will uh, talk about uh, future selection and model selection uh, again in a forthcoming uh, lecture. But right now, it's a future selection, and obviously, you're sacrificing a little bit of accuracy, but uh, you are gaining a lot in, um, in uh, computational time. So that's a trade-off that you have to deal with. And so what I have to tell you now is how do you actually select uh, which futures are uh, the most important to keep and which futures actually uh, you're going to, uh, to get rid of. And uh, so the idea here is to use uh, mutual information. And I hope uh, all of you uh, have uh, listened to the video on um, uh, information theory from a few lectures ago. Uh, so this is... Uh, the way uh, that mutual information is defined, and I define here mutual information between the future xj uh, and the class label y, okay? So again, I am defining mutual information between the future xj 
and uh, the class label Y, and you notice it is a, a, a sort of a measure of the independence of X, J, and Y, because I have the uh, joint distribution of X, J, and Y, and then the factorized distribution, and this is um, uh, minus basically the KL distance between this factorized product and the joint distribution of X, J, and Y. Okay, now, um, I am going to use uh, this uh, mutual information uh, measure in figuring out important uh, futures in, um, in uh, documents, right, where XJ will correspond to different uh, uh, words uh, in my uh, dictionary. And we will see that um, uh, words that have uh, the highest mutual information will be the most discriminative. Okay, so words that have the highest mutual information will be the most uh, discriminative. In some sense, um, this uh, measure of uh, mutual information, you can look at it uh, as the reduction in the entropy of the class label Y that comes in once you observe uh, the uh, future XJ. So again, is the reduction in the entropy in uh, uh, the class label Y once you observe the future uh, XJ, uh, okay? So obviously, we're going to be looking now for words um, in a document, right? In a document sort of classification, in words that they are the most discriminative, and uh, those most discriminative words will be the ones uh, that uh, maximize uh, the mutual information. Now, before I show you an example on, on uh, this document classification, uh, can we actually compute this at least for um, uh, the binary um, uh, future case? The answer is yes. And uh, for the binary case, all right, here is the final answer, the way it looks like. Um, so remember, we are computing this. Um, the, uh, the mutual information, again, uh, is defined uh, using my futures xj and the class labels y. That's why I have a subscript j here. But maybe I should also put, um, you know, well, actually, I don't need to put, um, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, any of this here. I, I don't need to put a subscript uh, because you notice this um, uh, class label c's are summed up, right? So if I go back on uh, on my um, on my definition here, I am defining the mutual information between XJ and, and uh, Y, but I'm going to be summing up over all possible labels Y, so I should not have uh, uh, any uh, subscript on the class labels. Now, I can put a subscript on J because I am still going to be working on um, this future XJ, but I'm going to be summing up for all possible values of uh, xj and in um, uh, in a binary case so the possible values of xj will be uh, xj equal to one and xj equal to zero so if i actually put in words what i just told you together and you defined uh, uh, pi c to be the probability of the class label being c uh, theta j c the probability once i'm in class c the the uh, future j to be on and um, and uh, theta j to actually be uh, the probability of xj being on, uh, regardless of what class I am in, right? So that will be uh, using the sum and product rules will be the summation over the class labels of pi c times theta j c. Okay. So again, this will be the probability of uh, the future being on, and uh, without caring on what class I am in. Okay. So. If you use these definitions, you can perform the uh, calculation of the mutual information. And again, I'm writing this explicitly. Uh, XJs can take values 0 and 1. Um, I need to sum this over the different classes uh, C. Okay. If you expand on the uh, cases that XJ is 1 and XJ equal to 0, you get things that look like this, uh, nothing major. And then the only thing I have to do is substitute uh, these probabilities uh, that uh, I'm computing through 
the training of the naive uh, Vegas classifier. So Pi C already has been computed, right, with my plug-in estimates, if you like, and Theta J C has been computed, and Theta J can be computed from the summation. And so if you plug in all of this in uh, the second equation here, uh, you get uh, the equation that you see um, uh, on the top of the slide. Okay, so I have a measure to figure out the mutual information between uh, the future J and uh, the class uh, label uh, Y. Okay, and let's see this uh, in uh, in action, and we're going to see this in the same uh, case of the two classes that I had before. Uh, for documents, one corresponding to uh, Microsoft uh, um, uh, Windows and the other one uh, corresponding to X Windows. And I remind you, when we computed uh, these theta values, right, the highest uh, probability um, uh, for uh, the uh, certain words to be in uh, each of these um, uh, classes, we computed that the word subject was uh, because of overfitting was almost with probability one belonging to both classes okay obviously uh, this is a direct result of overfitting now if on the other hand you compute the mutual information you can immediately see that the most discriminative words the words that have the two highest mutual informations uh, is the word windows number one and the word microsoft all right and that actually makes a lot of sense because uh, Windows and Microsoft is what separates uh, these two classes, right? I have two documents. One is Microsoft Windows and the other one is X Windows. So um, Windows and Microsoft uh, is uh, the most uh, two most discriminative uh, words. And then, of course, you have DOS, uh, Motif and Window uh, being uh, the third, fourth and the fifth word. So mutual information is a very nice measure uh, to actually um, uh, find the most discriminative uh, words, which is actually um, uh, the words that um, uh, play the dominant uh, role in the classification process. So that's a very nice uh, use of the uh, mutual information uh, in uh, this problem of future selection for naive Vegas uh, classifiers. Okay, um, now um, let me uh, discuss a, a bit of some uh, difficulties with this type of, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bag of words models, as I can uh, I call them. So, uh, remember our futures here are, um, you know, uh, these uh, uh, words and effectively in a, in a bag of words document I'm asking if um, uh, each of these uh, words uh, belongs in document I or not, okay? So um, XIJ counts if word J belongs in uh, document I, uh, XIJ uh, if uh, it doesn't, okay? And the probability model that we use up now is this uh, Bernoulli model that you see uh, summarized uh, on um, uh, this equation. Uh, but notice uh, these probabilities uh, theta JC and uh, 1 minus theta JC, uh, the way that we have used them uh, up to now, right? These are the probabilities that the word J belongs to the uh, document I, but you notice um, uh, these probabilities are independent of how many times I have seen this uh, each word XIJ. All right, so uh, we didn't really... Uh, in, in the previous model, we do not really account anywhere on how many times uh, a word uh, has appeared uh, in a given document. And this probability theta JC were independent, uh, uh, independent of that, okay? Uh, so we completely ignore the number of times that each word uh, occurs in, uh, in uh, each uh, document. And obviously that's not a very uh, accurate way uh, to model this uh, this type of uh, uh, you know of models, um, so um, obviously you know by ignoring this we lose some information and and the idea here is can we do a little bit better than that? Can we somehow start accounting uh, the number of um, uh, times 
uh, each word appears um, uh, in the model. And uh, the answer is, uh, yes, we can do this, all right? So what I'm gonna do here is, um, I am going to uh, introduce, uh, again, my uh, xij uh, variables, all right? Uh, to account if word j is uh, in document i. And I'm gonna define ni to be the total number uh, of words that they are in document i, okay? So ni is, um, you know, uh, the total number of words that they are in, uh, in document i. And you can see because of these constraints, uh, xij's are basically uh, constrained to satisfy now this equation that you see here. Okay, um, so how can I extend this uh, Bernoulli model? Well, we can use the multinomial distribution that we have uh, played with uh, in uh, earlier lectures. So the only thing we have to do is uh, write this conditional distribution of xi given the class labels uh, as a multinomial distribution, okay, where now I, um, I have a factorization over the futures of uh, theta jc to uh, a power uh, xij, all right, where xij is the number of times the word j uh, appears in uh, document i. So now we account for the frequency uh, of words uh, in the document. Uh, but we have, um, you know, uh, in do this calculation, right, um, obviously, by the way, this probability is exactly as before, they are, um, you know, they are uh, connected through the constraint that you see in the bottom of the slide. But there is, you know, a problem with this model. So what is the problem that if we have uh, a word that is uh, 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 very rare, so if the probability for a certain word uh, theta, for a certain word j is very small, so this theta jc is a very small number, theta to the power xij or nij, if you count uh, uh, this for all, um, uh, you know, uh, the occurrences of this word in the document, you basically, um, um, a small number to some power, turns out to be a very small number. So effectively, a word that is uh, very rare, uh, it will become increasingly unlikely that uh, you're going to see it again in the document. So if you see something, most probably you're not gonna see it again because the probability of rare events happening, rare words happening is extremely small, okay? Um, well, this, you know, it is um, uh, not quite, um, uh, a correct uh, way to uh, represent um, uh, uh, words in documents because there is what is called the burstiness of words. And what is the burstiness of words? Uh, it says that um, uh, that most words uh, never appear in any given document, but if they do appear, they are likely to appear more than once. So. The problem with our previous uh, model is that these probabilities that uh, uh, we had were fixed. So it doesn't account for the fact that if we have seen something that is rare, there is uh, an increasing uh, probability that we may see that word uh, again uh, in our document. Okay, so uh, how can you actually uh, resolve this problem? Well, this problem can be resolved by um, uh, using uh, what is called this uh, compound multinomial density uh, that I discussed, um, I think, in an earlier lecture, all right? So this is uh, effectively uh, what is called the multinomial uh, Dirichlet distribution, and it is defined. Let me just go directly. Uh, this distribution is just uh, this integral that you see here over the parameter space theta c, okay? So I am uh, the multinomial distribution. I'm looking um, in uh, uh, ni experiments, all right? Ni experiments, all right? Uh, uh, the probability of occurrences of uh, uh, the different uh, words, and I'm taking uh, a prior model for the parameters theta that is a Dirichlet model. But you notice I am averaging with respect to this uh, Dirichlet model. So what comes out of this is what is called the Dirichlet compound uh, multinomial density. And effectively, 
uh, what this uh, density uh, does is, you know, after you see some word J, uh, the posterior counts on theta J gets updated and, and because it gets updated, this makes the occurrence of the word J uh, uh, more likely. So if you see a one word, the probability of actually seeing it again has increased, is increasing. Okay? Uh, before, the probability of seeing a, a word uh, it was actually uh, constant. So this is, uh, it corresponds, and I can paraphrase what you can see uh, written on uh, Wikipedia. This corresponds to uh, uh, drawing a ball, basically. Uh, so you have, imagine you have um, a urn that has um, uh, balls with capital K uh, colors uh, of balls, and uh, you draw a ball from this urn, okay? You record the colors, and then you return this um, uh, ball back to the uh, to the urn. But what you do is you replace it with one additional copy. All right. So effectively, you are increasing the probability that the next time you will uh, pick up that particular uh, ball. And this is what is called the polyal uh, urn for those who want to investigate. Uh, 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 more for this type of uh, settings. So the idea here is we have this uh, burstiness uh, of words and we need to be sure that uh, words that uh, uh, appear once have an increasing probability of appearing again. And here we're not referring to uh, words that are very common words because really the very common words, uh, the probability of appearing again has nothing to do with how many times I have seen them before. So if you look at the word end, all right, or you say at, uh, things like that, it doesn't ma matter how many times you have seen them before, right? The probability of seeing them again, it is the same. And that also means that this um, uh, factorization that we did of the conditional distribution over futures, it's really, uh, appropriate for the common words, but is not as such uh, as much appropriate for rare words. For rare words, we need to account for burstiness, and to account for burstiness, we need to uh, sort of uh, increase the probability that once we see one of those rare words, uh, we want to be sure that the probability uh, of seeing them again increases. Okay, and uh, this Dirichlet compound multinomial distribution does this, okay, and this analog with this polya urine that I mentioned, uh, it is uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, an intuitive way to see how the number of uh, counts uh, increases for this rare word. So not only you replace the ball, all right, you put it back uh, when you're going to sample uh, again, but you replace it by adding an additional copy. So you increase basically the probability that you will pick up that particular ball, uh, that ball of that particular color uh, again. So these models uh, work uh, very nicely and actually even though uh, uh, the idea sounds rather heuristic, they perform very well, but there is uh, a problem that uh, I haven't said to you anything about uh, how to uh, train these models. Uh, we haven't really said anything about um, uh, maximum likelihood or MAP or posterior mean type of plug-in approximations. So if you're interested, you can read some of the references that are given uh, at the end of this uh, slide uh, that provide more information on that topic. All right, so that um, uh, sort of uh, provides us a summary for uh, generative uh, models for discrete futures. And again, uh, our focus uh, was, um, you know, uh, on uh, this naive Vegas classifier and uh, we try to emphasize throughout the um, uh, today's lecture and the last lecture, we try to emphasize uh, the idea of having uh, plug-in uh, estimates that actually introduce uh, regularization even on the limit uh, of uninformative priors and that led us to this concept of Edwin smoothing that it is very critical for everybody to remember. So uh, Edwin smoothing uh, will actually allow you to do predictions even if you have uh, uh, no observations for the particular, let's say, future in a particular class that, uh, that you're looking at.
Okay, so uh, that's all for uh, today. Uh, we will meet again in uh, two days uh, to continue on uh, our Bayesian exploration lectures. Bye.